Hey everybody, welcome back to the Sixth Round Post Fight Show with me, Zane Simon, and my co-host Eddie Mercado. As always, we are back here talking about a UFC event went down at the Apex Center in Las Vegas, Nevada, where uh, Cynthia Calvillo beat Jessica I in the main event. This is one of those cards that kind of kicked off and everybody was like, oh, you know, you got all these people coming out of the woodwork and being like, man, this is one of those events, you know, everybody was looking at it and being like, nobody, no good fights on this card and it's really coming out of the gate strong. And then we got like nothing but decisions all the rest of the way. Yeah, I was ex exceptionally happy because I was doing, I had to do play by play for the main card. So <laughs> After the first three, I'm like, yeah, like, that's what's up. The way this night's going, it's going to be one of those. Mm. No one cares about who's fighting, but the fights just turn out to be fire and a bunch of wicked finishes, so it makes yep. up for everything. But, yeah, once once that uh, <laughs> Diva Chevelli fight happened, it kind of – it was like, oh, yeah, I remember this guy. I know what's coming. So, like, I kind of expected that one. Yeah. But, like, the Espinosa fight – I was like, man, come on, guys! Like it was, it was competitive, but it just, it wasn't, it wasn't like top tier. It didn't. Yeah, I mean that's it, that's it the thing. Drama. A card like this and having fights like that, like Espinosa, De La Rosa, totally fine fight. Feely Jordan, totally fine fight. Uh, you know, Rosa Aguilar, not great, but Tough, like gritty fight. You stick all these fights together where they don't have any meaning, they don't have any like big, exciting, technical sort of points to them where you're like, oh man, watching, you know, watching Charles Jourdain hit those spinning back fists or something, you know, it doesn't like, you're not watching the, te the technical pinnacle of the sport. Mm -hmm. And so then it really like even okay fights all stacked together like that. They just kind of start to drag. Yeah, I definitely had that feeling. Um, Feely and Jordan was fun for me. I thought that was uh, it was exciting, um, mainly because uh, J Jordan did, did get that knockdown in the first. Yeah. So I was yeah. like, oh, well, obviously some they got the power. It could be, yep. you know, Jordan's one of those sleeper guys. So I was intrigued at least for that one. And like the Rosa fights, Rosa always is in there like he's fighting for his life. And yep. like that's fun. Uh, so like it was, it was an okay card. We definitely it started out with a bang, yeah. the, um, but it, it that, ended with a stinker. I'll say. The, like, the, thing, the thing is, is that you know what I was getting. The point we're getting around to is that fight cards like this they always depend on the main event for their the lasting impact that they have. And Galvio versus I was just like it. It was a very fun. It was a fight. I think somebody put it best. It did not need five rounds to decide it. Mm -hmm. It was clear within three rounds that Cynthia Calvillo was the better fighter. And she won this fight. And getting two more rounds of it, just not necessary. It kind of is, though, because we needed to see Calvillo uh, in championship rounds. If, yeah. if, if we're going to act like she's next for Valentina, then well, you need not. to... Well, I mean, who else is? They're going to book Joanne Calderwood, and uh, then Calvillo is going to have to fight probably Caitlin Chukagian. Since Chukagian called her out, I think the UFC is probably just going to jump on that fight and make it. And if Chukagian wins, then they just lost Calvillo as a contender. Yeah, I'm interested to see how they play that. Because, yeah. I mean, you beat the number one person on paper, and, and not even on paper, just with like how rankings mean nothing and like it doesn't matter. Anyone can get a title. Like Jose Aldo is fighting for a title. Yeah, you know, it doesn't. It doesn't matter. There's really nobody. That division is starving for yeah. anyone remotely resembling a title challenger. Yeah. So I think the UFC will do whatever they can to keep that. Yeah, I don't know. I, I just don't think. I don't think they. You know, I don't necessarily think they think that far ahead. If they've got somebody, if they don't have somebody who they think is going to be a big star right away, you know, like then. I don't think anybody at the UFC head offices at this point is banking on, like... It, I guess it's a testament to the fact that they must think something of Calvillo. That they gave... They made this fight a headlining fight. But... Yeah. I, I don't, you know... I don't think that they would, like, try to protect her from anything. That's the thing, is, like, Calvillo had moments in this fight where she had the back. She could have gotten yeah. a choke. And if she would have, 
you know, I would be way more excited for her debut at Flyweight. Yeah. But, like, that's yeah. not what happened. Like, she's, she did enough to uh, decisively defeat the number one person, but didn't do enough to, to, you know, really entertain the idea that she has anything for Valentina Shevchenko. Yeah. And, you know, to be fair, too, like, Jessica I's spot as the number one person is entirely built on a split decision over Caitlin Chukagian. Like, yeah, that's it. That is the fight that she had, like, the big win she has. And then, you know, she lost the title shot and then beat Vivi- Viviana Raujo. And, like, that's a good one. That's a good win as well. But that's not, like, why Jessica I is, you know... A win over Viviana Raujo is not the reason that I is the number one ranked right. for the number one spot. No, it's a lack of depth. <laughs> yeah, it's a lack of depth. So, you know, th- this is, it- it's just one of those things where we, you get a card that is not booked, you know, it's a, it's a pandemic card. It's a card with all <laughs> the people who are, are in the States, chomping at the bit, will, are ready to fight on a moment's notice. And could be booked short enough. Like even even in the main event, Cynthia Calvillo is talking about how like she had barely any time to train for this fight. You know? Yeah. I mean, it's just the way things are. Yeah. That's why you know we're seeing people regularly. Like a lot of these guys. D- Mark De La Rosa got knocked out like three months ago. Uh-huh. Four months ago. How is he? How was he even medically cleared to train for this? Like. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Hand it's just a weird time. Yeah. They got to do, do we- what they can. Hannah Seifer is pulling the, the reverse Chris Lieben and win, losing two fights in two weeks. <laughs> Here you go. That's a tough one. Yeah. Well, all right. Let's get to the co-main event and talk about this catchweight fight at 190 pounds between Marvin Vittori and Carl Roberson. And I will say this to me, this is that kind of win where you're talking about if if Cynthia Calvillo had had this kind of win, you would be like, oh man, I'm excited to see what Cynthia Calvillo can do in her next couple fights in the division. Mm-hmm. Like this is the kind of fight where I expected Vittori to go out there. And I really honestly just expected him to kickbox with Roberson and fight the, the most dangerous fight possible. And instead he just went out there and took him down and, Roberson's a game grappler, but Vittori was two steps ahead on the on the mat. Well, I mean, it kind of seemed like Vittori was was gonna do that and just come out and kickbox him, but it uh-huh. was it was um it was on the feet. It, Roberson just took the back, standing in this weird kind of scramble, yep. and then that just initiated this True. washing machine of positional changes and Vittori just kept coming out on top. And even when Vittori would, you know, go for a submission, overcommit to it and lose position, he would get it right back. Yeah. Like it, it was just night and day. Like he was clearly better on the ground and Roberson was just a little too willing to go there. I'll say. Yeah. I mean, that's definitely a big part of it. I remember at, t- at some point in the broadcast early on, I mean, it wasn't, it was only a four minute fight. So, you know, not that deep in, right. but at some point in the broadcast of the fight, the booth was like, Oh, you know, and Marvin Vittori, we've seen him like kickboxing a lot. Like we've seen him using his hands a lot and looking pretty good at his boxing skills, but he's actually got a lot more submissions than knockouts. And I was just immediately like, yeah, but you know, Carl Roberson does too. Right. Like, you can talk about his kickboxing background all day, but he has two knockouts in his whole career, and all of his other stoppage wins have been by submission. Yeah. And, you know, that's what you saw here. We've seen it before in the UFC when he choked out Charles Bird. Like, he's he's a very willing grappler, and sometimes for guys when they're really trying to be well-rounded in their game and they don't have that depth of skill yet, that aggression really, you know, they really pay for it. Yeah, and you know it's experience, fight IQ, all that wrapped into one. Um, I gotta say though, man, Vittori really showed up here. Yeah, and like he had so much intensity with the the way the first fight got scratched all together, and how upset he was, and the little altercation, and then Roberson misses weight again by four and a half pounds. I mean, you have to. You know, but Vittori was all in his head about this. So for yep. him to to channel that in a positive way and and really show up and like didn't hold a grudge. Once 
once he he had the tap, he let go instantly. I was a little nervous that he might have held on a little longer. I'm not yeah, gonna lie. yeah, he, I did. he does seem like he channels his aggression in that kind of way that you could really see him just kind of going nuts and <laughs> being foolish out there. But no, he was he was he was fine afterward. Yeah, it was it was good to see real composed. Uh-huh. But it was I like I love this fight the way it built. It started yeah. out real tentative, tentative, and they slowly started closing the gap. And then as soon as as soon as Vittori started committing to his combos, Roberson committed to his, and the grappling ensued, and it just became this mad dash. Yep. I really enjoyed it. Yeah, and you know, like there was it was like dominant enough win for Vittori, talking about getting back to your feelings on like the Calvillo fight and creating excitement. Like I saw people after this saying like, oh, you know, Marvin Vittori should fight Yoel Romero next. <laughs> and I'm like, okay, Yoel Romero is not going to fight Marvin Vittori. No. Right now. But that is exactly the kind of effect you want a win to have, you know? Absolutely. People- like you want, you want people to see a fight like that. And they're like, oh man, I got to see that guy fight again next time. I want to see him in something big. Like he's honestly probably going to end up fighting Christoph Yatko or something. Just, you know, cause the rest of that division is so booked up right now in the top, but people want to see him in the biggest fight he can get right now. Man, him and Ian Heinish. Yeah. That is the fight I need to see. Just, it would be such a, barn burner so wild and primal that's a that's a fight i need to see but yeah i was you know this this is exactly the kind of impressive performance vittori needed i think out of all that it's it's a fight that pushes him into the mix like you said you were saying in a fight with ian heinish that would be awesome it's it's you know it's crazy i think heinish is already booked again though oh i believe it man yeah, it's like wants- people during this time, they're getting booked the second they exit the octagon. Yeah, anybody who's available to fight right now and is just ready and, you know, because he won immediately too after the last fight. Yeah, he's in he's in a fight that makes no sense. He's fighting Brendan Allen uh, mm. in another, like, two weeks, <laughs> you know? Wow. So well, Good for him. Yeah. I would love to see Heinish Vittori, though. That would be an awesome fight. Yeah. It's too bad that they couldn't wait and book book that instead. That brings us to a lightweight bout. Charles Rosa, Kevin Aguilar. Um, outside the main event, maybe the least thrilling fight on the card, honestly. I mean, th- th- this fight, yeah, I remember, I mean, you know. Thriller. I mean, that Divish Philly fight was pretty dry for me. Yeah, I like watching Dvosh really do all of his madcap wrestling. But um, even if it's pretty one-sided. You don't, you, mean, you, don't care, you don't care for the poor man, Stephen Thompson? Well, there's that. It's also that, like, Rosa and Aguilar are both counter-strikers. And they got pushed a little bit closer together in this cage. So they, you know, they actually exchanged a few more shots. But I get the feeling, you know, it was still very much like two counter fighters trying to figure out which one of them had to lead. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, and neither of them, neither of them really wanted to because the second they did, they would disengage. Yeah, the second they they did, they would immediately hop back because they knew that the counter shot was waiting for them. And credit to Rosa, like he found that looping left hand of his over and over and over again along with his low kicks, and he was able to kind of steal this fight away. Not yeah, a bad he, perf- I was impressed. Uh, yeah. He really found a groove, and yeah. it, it was almost as if he solved the puzzle. You mm-hmm. know, by the third round, he was like, wait a minute, if I just stand southpaw and I throw this left hand, it's going to land every time, and I just have yep. to trust that it's going to land. And, yep. man, credit to him for – you know, fighting through that little bit of adversity. I think it was a clash of heads that yep. caused the, the a pretty mean gash on the forehead. Uh, he was bleeding, and, you know, judges, they don't know, you know, what the deal is. Cage side, is it a headbutt? Is it not? Real yep. time, you don't, you don't really know. So who knows, going to the scorecards, this was a split. It was a really close fight. I, I think Rosa did enough. Oh, I think yeah. He, he just... This, he was a better second-half fighter here. 
Yep. Yep. Rough, rough loss for Aguilar, who, you know, really started out in the UFC with a couple of, of great wins over uh, Rick, Bl- Rick Glenn and Enrique Barzola, but now has dropped three in a row. And it's just kind of finding, having trouble catching up to the speed of faster fighters in this division. Feels like. Yeah, that's a problem too. Yeah. You don't want to be slow at lightweight. No, no. Well, and this was like, these are featherweights fighting at lightweight. Yeah. So even, even, even more so at featherweight, you don't want to be a slow guy. Yeah. Uh, that brings us though to Andre Feely, Charles Jordan, and. This was a solid scrap. I'm actually a little surprised that this didn't win, like, fight of the night. There wasn't a fight of the night, um, all told. It felt like this was really a, a solid back-and-forth war. Both guys landing lots of shots. Feely got dropped in round one. And it actually it feels pretty rare to me to see a fight where somebody gets dropped like he did in the first round. And I mean, you see guys get dropped and come back for a stoppage, but it's pretty rare to see them get get dropped and come back to just like control and eke out the next two rounds. You know, I feel like I see it more with prospects. Like a prospect will get clipped early, and yeah. come back and just own the next three rounds. Especially with a lot of the uh, collegiate wrestlers that are transitioning yeah. into MMA. You know, they'll get caught and recover and. Yeah, start getting their wrestle on and their grind on. Um, but yeah, it, it is it is kind of odd. Um, but this was an extremely close fight. Yeah, it, it really was. Both men just not really giving an inch. Jordan uh, kind of slowing down there at the end, but the pace he was putting on early was just incredible. Throwing tons of spinning attacks, crafty entries, attacking the leg. He's just dealing- clearly got an insane amount of confidence in his chin and in his willingness and like that what he's going to throw is going to work. Like his technique isn't always clean. His balance isn't always there, but he will launch himself at you with like a back fist into a body kick with the absolute certainty that it is going to land really hard. And it lands a lot. It kind of reminds me of Lando Fanata in a way. Yeah. Yeah. Without, a, without the movement. Mm-hmm. I, I, I think it's crafty and, it's effective and he's a sleeper guy you know he's pulling out these these wins that you don't think he's putting on these performances you aren't expecting like knocking out duho Choi was insane that's absolutely yep. insane uh putting up this kind of fight against feely who's seasoned he's been around i think he was ranked at one point in time and you know credit credit to jordan i mean he lost here but i i still think his stock goes up i think he, he showed a lot in this fight and yeah he showed that the, the Duho Choi fight wasn't a fluke. And, you know, he, he's talented. And yep. Feely's on the mic talking about how, you know, he wants elite fighters, elite fighters. And I, I agree. You know, he's been around for a, a long time. Why not just feed him to the wolves and see where he lands? Yeah, you know what I think they should do? What's on that? that note, Andre Feely, Edson Barboza. <laughs> I love everything about that. <laughs> like aside from Barbosa at forty five, I love everything about that. Yeah, I mean Barbosa's not ranked in the division. He he took a, a hard, controversial loss in his first fight at featherweight. It's a chance for him to bounce back, and it's a fan, a chance for Feely to get the kind of big fight he wants without it still being like, oh, we're gonna throw you at a top ten guy right now in the rankings, at least. I think Barboza really le- le- legitimately is a top 10 guy, but it's a chance for both of them to prove that, you know? Barboza mm-hmm. can go out there, and if he can just put Feely away, then he gets to get his street cred back and be right back in the thick of the division. And for Feely, he's calling for a big fight. This is his chance to prove he can beat somebody who's been there at the elite, you know? I'm 100% on board with that. Why not? Yeah. And it, I can't believe Barboza is not ranked. Well, like he lost to, you know, the number 15 featherweight in his debut. Yeah, I guess, technically. In the division, yeah, technically, exactly. I mean, that's the problem with rankings, though. Is it like, you know, I think that win over Barboza, like, bumped Dan Ige up to, like, number 11 or 10 or something for rankers, but it doesn't get Barboza a slot, even though it clearly means that much. Yeah. 
you know? It's it's definitely odd. Yeah. I don't know. I but, love that fight though. I love Feely, that fight. Feely's exciting. He's he's down to come out and put on exciting fights. He's willing to take the punches. Yep. He's the hittable. other option would be maybe somebody like Cub Swanson, you know? I love where you're going with this. Guys who are gritty and they'll bang it out. And yeah, good strikers who have been elite fighters and just – they're not in the title picture right now, but they would be a great proving point for Feely to get his point across. There's tons of guys he can go against, honestly. Yeah. Oh, always. I mean, a guy Arnold Allen. Be... That's a great matchup. Hmm? Arnold Allen? Yeah, no. Oh, yeah. I mean, if he if, if they want to book him and get him a ranked fighter, Danny Gay, Arnold Allen, uh, or Ryan Hall, those would all be super good fights. You know, like Feely's got. It, but I'm I'm just I just want to get him that name fight. You know. I want to get him in there with that guy where he, that somebody he looks up to, that he he's thinking about like, Oh, I love to fight this guy. Like, you know, I, I doubt that Andre Feely is out there looking up and like thinking, Oh man, I would love to fight Arnold Allen someday. Uh, maybe Jeremy Stevens. Yeah. Maybe Jeremy Stevens. That might work, but you know, he would love to fight Edson Barboza. Like you just, you can picture that. Yeah. Well, maybe it'll happen. Maybe, yeah. maybe, maybe the MMA gods will listen to you, Zane, and book that maybe. because it makes all the sense. Exactly. All right, that brings us to a band about Jordan Espinoza, Mark De La Rosa, and uh, once again, De La Rosa struggling with athletes, and for Jordan Espinoza, a good opportunity for him to prove that he is a flyweight level athlete. You know. Absolutely. Um, I liked his movement out there. He was really fluid. He was loose. It looks like he did a great job of warming up in the back. He came out ready to fight. And the way he was just working off his jab, just sticking and moving, using his footwork, um, addressing the aggression of De La Rosa, because De La Rosa was pressing forward. He yeah. wasn't throwing anything. And, you know, he, and when he would throw a flurry, he would do so just to close the distance into the clinch. And once he was in the clinch, I mean, he was content to just hold on to a single leg and get elbowed into oblivion. Yeah, that's I mean, that's honestly been the uh, the other problem. Other than being a little too foot slow for flyweight, De La Rosa has had a big problem that he's he's a very good top grappler. Like that's the core of his game is grappling from on top in like half guard in mount. And he's not a very good wrestler so you know he he got he got espinoza to the clinch here for like a round and a half and had him trapped on the cage and just got beat up there honestly that's hard to watch yeah i really i can't stand watching guys just die on that hill they yeah they the, the clinging to the single leg yeah. while just getting absolutely owned i mean I honestly would have given if I had been the judge cage side, I would have given, given Jordan Espinoza a 10, eight round one, man. I was on the fence. I was doing play by play for this. And I was, I was, is this a 10, eight? Is it a 10, nine? almost a hundred strikes or maybe it was a hundred strikes in one round, to like, but to like eight, a lot of those, a lot of that was pitter patter. It was, but I, still like to that point that you are wiping somebody out that far. I would just be like, nah. But you're eight. not wiping them out that far. You're wiping them out while they're controlling you. So but it's the, like the control doesn't mean anything. I think it means enough to not get ten aided. I don't think so. I would. I Fairly. would much rather see judges just be like, too bad. Learn to learn to be more aggressive. Learn to be <laughs> more functional, or you pay. Uh I could see it either way. I was on All the right. fence, but I settled for the 10-9. Either okay. way, I mean, I DLR did... is probably on his way out, man. This was like three or four straight yeah. losses. Yep. It's so he's probably going to get his walking papers. Yeah, it's four straight losses. Even in a flyweight division, they're trying to rebuild. That's probably going to get him shown the door, honestly. Tough break. Definitely. All right, that brings us to a woman's flyweight fight, Maria Agapova, Hannah Seifers. And I I don't know if I underrated Maria Agapova or she just is that much better or the, the physical mismatch was just that notable. But Agapova came out there and 
absolutely whipped Seifers. You know, oh, yeah. she was I possessed. Thought, I thought Seifers would be able to hang on the feet and like make this a battle as long as it was out. Like, as long as she could keep it in the pocket, she would be able to keep it a battle. I didn't think she'd mm-hmm. win, but figured she could. You know, every time, competitive. Any, anytime it wasn't way outside or all the way in the clinch, I thought Seifers might do okay. No, no, she got ran over here. Yeah. Agapova was just landing three or four strikes to every one Seifers threw. Was, it, the, Seifers was better in the clinch. She was a more bullying clinch fighter, but, you know, she pushed so hard to get to that clinch position eventually that Agapova just hooked a leg around her, jumped on her back, and choked her unconscious. So, yeah. Well, that was also right after she was, <laughs> rocked her, dropped her with the head kick. That was so yeah. sweet. Oh my goodness, was that sweet. Yeah. No, so, I loved what I saw at Agapova here. This was a great debut. It is rough as hell for Hannah Seifers, who seems really nice, like a lovely person. Like she's learning and trying to build a very fun, a very fun and functional MMA game. But whoever her manager is, and I think I said this last time too, after the Mackenzie Dern fight, mm-hmm. they clearly are not watching out for this this woman, you know? Yeah, and maybe it's a personal thing. Maybe she's just one of those shoot at anybody, anywhere, anytime. Old yeah, I mean, I, I, I'm sure she just wants to really like ingratiate herself to the promotion. She wants to be a go-to action fighter, somebody they can always call and will pick up and say yes. And or you know, it could even be that maybe like maybe after her last fight, she was technically cut. And then the UFC called her up and be like, "Well, we'll give you another fight if you take this one on a week's notice." I wouldn't be surprised if there's all sorts of weird backroom deals going on right now just to get these fights to happen. Yeah, because, like, otherwise, like, she's an atom weight fighting a flyweight who used to be a bantam weight. It's just not good. Yeah, <laughs> no, it, it wasn't good. But it was a great win for Agapova. Yeah, I mean, it looked terrifying out there. That's exactly what you want to see from a true prospect in that kind of physical mismatch. You want to see somebody just absolutely torch their opponent where you're never in doubt that they're the better fighter. So, you know, like, there may be, like, a fight with Sabina Mazo out there. That'd be pretty fun. Or, Um, you know, somebody like that, Justine Kish. For uh, uh, who'd she call out? She called out Shanna Dobson. Shanna Dobson, three and four. Shanna Dobson. Yes, one and three in the UFC. <laughs> Shanna Dobson. Well, I guess you know, aim high, right? Yeah, I think there must be some personal beef. I bet this was like, I bet that's a fight that they were supposed to have on the regional scene back in the day, and didn't Just- didn't happen. Well, she said that she was running from her, which is a weird yeah. thing to say. That's not a regular call out. That's personal. Yeah, it, it, there's got to be some kind of personal beef where they were supposed to fight at some point in the past and didn't. Because it's otherwise, it's total nonsense. Like, I don't want to see that fight. Yeah. Like, is Dobson even still under contract? I don't know. I have no idea. Like, I, Hannah Seifers at this point was a bigger challenge. <laughs> I, well, like, Let's move up to, you know, Pollyanna Botello or somebody like that. Somebody who's been picking up some wins in the promotion. Or, yeah, anybody else, really. Yeah. Even Priscilla Cachoeira, she came out and had a big win in her last fight over Shanna Dobson. <laughs> the plot thickens. Yeah. But Agapova... Looked great. And I mean, like, you know, that's a good thing. That's a great thing to see for the future of flyweight. It's going to take a while for the UFC really like constantly picking up and churning through. They just got to, they got to constantly sign fighters and cut out the dead weight as they go. Like, I hate to say that too, because, you know, these are people's careers that you're talking about when you start like reducing them to just like, oh, you know, Time to get time for this them to cut this person. They're not really performing and all that. Like this is somebody's job. I don't want to see anybody get fired. But that is how you get 
more that that's how you find more talent is you create this kind of mill and churn where you're bringing people in you're testing them out you're finding out if they meet the grade athletically and if they don't you move on and you find more people like maybe, maybe dobson is the right move for agapova go the opposite of the cyphers route yeah no kidding you know, just build your record get some time in because sure. i did that too man i was like oh she looked really great. This was terrifying. She looks venomous. She yep. looked dangerous on the feet with her strikes and then finished with the submission. Yep. Okay. Maybe she can maybe she can compete with Valentina Shevchenko. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like that's the natural thing, right? But it's like, no, she's super young in her career. Yeah. Let her mature. Come up properly. We don't want to see her go the Macy Barber route where yeah. like they're just every fight like, oh, she's going to be a title because she wants to be champion by 20. She's going to do all this stuff. And then you throw her in there and she like gets whomped by Roxanne Modafferi, you know? Yeah, she's only 23 years old. Yeah. So I'm not saying it has to be a huge step forward. I would just say that it should be somebody coming off a win. That's you fair. know? And if it's not, if it's someone coming off a loss, then it, it better be someone tough and seasoned and yeah, you know, yeah, dangerous in some exactly. sort. Exactly. Of... Somebody like and and uh, Andrea Lee or something like that. Yeah. You know? All right, that brings us to a catch weight about 140 pounds, basically a bantamweight fight. Marab Davajvili, Gustavo Lopez, and I am a shocked this fight got made at all because gustavo lopez combate champ his manager forgot to ask for his release from combate before accepting this bout and uh yeah. combate had a matching clause in his contract and but uh campbell mclaren after there was some twitter kerfuffle and back and forth they let him walk so yeah campbell's a uh, he's a he's an all right guy, that Cameron yeah. McLaren. Oh yeah, he's okay. He's he's a decent dude. But um, I'm I was just glad because you see, you know, I expected that UFC would just the moment that that went out and became a thing, I thought the UFC would just drop the whole thing and just be like, nope, sorry, too bad. Like I think if Joe Silver were still around, that's what would have happened. Because were there Fertitas? And well, Joe was like he was the heartless bastard in the match. <laughs> it was just like, look, you promised me you could do this. You can't get out. You yeah. know, that was very much the Joe Silva attitude. So I kind of expected that to happen here. I'm glad to see Gustavo Lopez get in. And honestly, you know, considering this is a day's notice and a terrible style matchup for him. He did as well as he could have. Yeah, I mean, Devalish Philly, that's, it's, he set another takedown record. He's broke yeah. his own takedown record. I mean, well, I, that's just one fight people should avoid like the plague. Because yeah. he's, he's going to come and throw just this weird volume at you, and the second you try to defend it, he's going to close the distance and take you down, and then you're caught in the washing machine. And it's Especially for, like, Lopez's style, you go watch his combate bouts, and you see he's got this really slow-paced, pressure-power-punching style that he backs up with takedowns. Yeah. And it's like, so your style to fight Mayor Abdavashvili is to walk at him without throwing a lot of volume, <laughs> and if that doesn't work, wrestle with him. Yeah. Really not yeah. going to happen. Yeah, it's... So. Abdavashvili is really talented, and his biggest asset, in my opinion, is his motor. Yep. The dude can just go and go and go, and that is so tough to deal with. And like, he's not a terrible striker. Like, he's no. he's got some some technique there and some skills. He's improving a lot there. He's fun. Yep. He's fun in a weird way. He, he called out Sean O'Malley, and uh, if I were Sean O'Malley's manager, I'd avoid that fight like the plague. You have to. Yeah. You have to. You're gunning for Garbrandt. Yeah. Devalish Philly is not on your on your radar. No. You can't even say his name. But you know what I would like to see then is Marib Devashvili versus Enrique Barzola. Ooh. Ooh. I want to see it. 
NCAA Peruvian <laughs> collegiate yeah. wrestling versus the Georgian. What's his background? Is it Sambo or uh, Judo, uh, right? Judo, yeah. Yeah, Judo Black Belt. Yeah, that's interesting. That or Hani Barcelos. Dude, you know, yeah. bricked up Brazilian wrestle boxer, a lot of power there. Like, keep Dvalishvili throwing him at these, like, you know, swarming, powerful, attacking fighters. Put him into constant wars. He's just going to be fun all the time in those kinds of fights. Yeah, he's it's that endless gas tank is. He's just so crazy out yeah. there. I mean, hell, I'd even I'd even watch the watch him fight Song Yadong. Ooh, that's interesting. Like that would be that would be a fascinating challenge for Yadong, you know, because there's a ton of confidence there. There's a, a skill level level for Song Yadong that's always a little deeper than you expect for how sort of flashy and confident it looks like his style is. Mm -hmm. but he's still shown like he's the, the deep, the further in fights he's start has been going lately, the more it's just been barely squeaking them out. Yeah. He so, had that weird fight with Stamen. Yeah. He had that weird fight with Stamen. And a lot of people thought he lost to Marlon Vera. Um, yeah. Vera certainly put a, a hell of a fight on him late in that fight. So, you know, putting him in there against like a super nonstop aggressive wrestler, like Devalish really would be pretty fun. Very interesting. Like, if you don't have a strong wrestling base, good luck dealing with this guy. Yeah. So, there's a lot of fights. I'm interested to see Dvalishvili in a lot of fights, but definitely any 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 prospect who's thinking about themselves as a title challenger in the next two or three years should just be like, nope, pass. <laughs> yeah. Um, also, that's four straight for him. So, he yeah. is on the rise. And you shouldn't have to wait long because he fights like every other day. So I'm sure yeah. he'll be on next weekend's card fighting someone else who fights every day. Yeah, he, he seems like a dude who will fight anyone on any card and will always be ready and always be in the gym. And it seems like he doesn't ever get hurt. Uh, like he, no, it seems I, like I he comes out of these fights so healthy, no injuries. I, th I, I think he's been like he, – I think he's an earth elemental in wrestling <laughs> shorts. <laughs> You know, it very like, well could be. He probably like floats across the octagon. He doesn't really touch the ground. Yeah, he, he seems like he was just like cast out of wrought iron and like a blob that just you know was given life accidentally and will never stop wrestling. Yeah, I wonder how he makes weight. Maybe it's the levitation. Yeah, it could be. All right, that brings us to a, a woman's band and weight bout. Julia Avila, Gina Mazzani. And I knew this was kind of a physical mismatch going in here. I knew it was a stylistic mismatch, but Avila put all that into practice and, and made, made it very clear that she is, yes, the more legit athlete and that going in and trying to just, like, clash with her and take her on in a bunch of pocket and clinch exchanges is a terrible idea. A villa showed up. Yep. She was not playing any games. Uh, no. Once that knee to the body landed and yep. Gina was hurt, a villa went into overdrive and yep. she threw all the punches and yep. all Mazzani could do was shell up in full yep. in standing fetal mode. She was like crouched over, not even, she couldn't even drop down. She was getting pummeled so hard. It was like, Dave Monet versus oh, Phil Baroni back in the yeah. game where he's just like blasting him and he can't even – it wasn't that bad. Don't get me no. wrong. This, this was a TKO. It, but it was it, still cool to see it, an overwhelming performance like that. It's, it's rare to see a standing TKO. It is way rare to see what feels like a totally reasonable standing TKO within 20 seconds. Like mm – -hmm. Most standing TKOs are a result of like it's like Tony Ferguson, Justin Gagey. Yeah, it's really. building. It's building. Yeah, you have been. You, this person has been getting beat hard for round after round, and any any like quick stoppage like that usually you're like, oh well, they should have let that one go. This was like, no, nope, twenty seconds, she's done. Stop it. That's fine. And they could have stopped it sooner, honestly. 
Like she was taking, she took quite a few punches. She was in fetal mode for quite a while. Yeah. Yeah. Was, I mean, that's and that's crazy that for a 22 happen. second fight. Yeah. Great win for Avila though. New, you know, she's definitely, if they can get, if they can keep her active, she seems like she's got, she's got some noise to make in the Bantamweight division. So and she, uh, anybody willing to throw like that, I'm, I am a hundred percent on board to watch them fight. Yeah, absolutely. Hope they get her a good step forward after this bout because her, her her two debut opponents in the octagon have been well. Panny Kean's odds really experienced, so I shouldn't say that they've been like a big notch below her level. But this was a big step back from Panny Kean's odd, and I'd like to see them, you know, step her up in her next fight after this. And that brings us to a catchweight fight: Tyson Nam, Zaruk Adashev. And they really tried to sell Adashev as this great kickboxer with this phenomenal kickboxing track record. They called him a K1 champ in the lead up. <laughs> I don't know exactly what WKUK1 is. Um, I'm sure it's an offshoot of K1, the K1 brand. But certainly, I, I don't think it's nearly as Im- impressive or notable as his 16 and three three overall like glory glory World Series record, or yeah. probably not even than his hand to hand combat championship record. But nonetheless, the dude was three and one in MMA, having only fought the worst possible competition. <laughs> this was not like it was late notice. I'm glad Nam got paid. I'm glad he had a big highlight win. This fight should not have happened. No, it shouldn't have happened. But I'm glad it did because that was a sweet 32-second knockout. Yeah. And I, I Just watching the fight and watching Nam's mannerisms throughout it and the way he was reading Adashev and he was like, okay, you came in with that. That was good. Okay, you came in with that. Okay, that was good okay, now it's my time to go. And he just uncorked the, like a Cody Garbrandt right hand. Yeah. You know, this came from the floor and landed clean. And he dove down with one follow-up strike that put Adashev out cold. And that was pretty much a wrap. Yeah, I mean, that's what we've been waiting to see for a while from Tyson Nam. He's one of the rare flyweights out there with real stopping power. Mm Mm-hmm. And he's got a style that doesn't always lend itself to winning rounds. He's a slow paced pressure fighter. He, you know, takes him a while to get his reads often, but they served him this KO on a platter and it was great to see him take advantage of it. And that's the thing. He's got that power, but it's usually, it comes in the form of solo strikes. Yeah. So yeah. Piecing things together is not really his strong suit. So nope. when he has someone who is willing to just come straight forward at him, he can find his opening to just land that one clean shot. Yeah. And that's what happened here. Yep. And mismatch, yes. Still cool? Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, Adashev gets a, a bigger payday than he's probably seen in most of his career to this point. And uh, Nam finally picks up a UFC victory, which is, you know, like it was clearly incredibly important to him. And the result of a really shockingly long MMA career to this point. You know, the man's been doing this for 14 years. Why do I feel like he's had a UFC win before? That's that's almost shocking to me. Yeah, no, walked in against Sergio Pettis and then Kai Cara France. Man. You know, he's got wins over Eduardo Dantas and Ali Bagatinoff in the past. That's what I remember. I remember him knocking out Dantas. Yep. And maybe that's why I feel like he was in the UFC before. For some reason, I feel like he was one of those guys who had a little stint in the UFC and then left for a while, and now he's back. But I guess he never nope. really made it to the UFC before. He was just one of MMA's true, true journeymen, going all over the world, fighting anybody, anywhere, winning a lot because he's got that power, he's got that speed, he's got that size. But losing a lot of random fights, too, because he fights at that slow pace in a division that's all about fast, high-output fights. Yeah, and the guys he lost to are 
really phenomenal strikers. Yeah, well, Sergio you know, you get Kai back into some of there's a few in there. Mix is a mix. He's had a lot of up and downs. Well, I just mean in the UFC. Yeah, in the UFC they are. Yeah, I mean, th- at this point in his career, he's clearly got his game really well tuned. It's just fighters like you know Sergio Pettis is one of the few f- straw weight or f- few flyweights who has a really long jab striking game, and it's just like you know a short power hook game from Nam is never going to track down Sergio Pettis. Right. And then Kai Car France was just busier. Busier, a lot of footwork movement. Yep. So glad to see Tyson Nam get that win. Great this was moment his for Super him. Bowl. This was his Super Bowl. Yeah, clearly very emotional afterwards. And, uh, you know, glad to see him stick around. Because Adashiev will get another shot. But for Nam, this is a kind of a do-or-die fight for him, I'm sure. And that brings us to the opening bout. And Christina Aguilera. Christian. Christian. Not Christina. Christian. 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 <laughs> Damn you, Zane. <laughs> I was like, don't say Christina Aguilera. Don't say Christina Aguilera. And what do you do right off the bat? You say Christina Aguilera. Thank you for taking the pressure off of me. <laughs> <sighs> I can't. I couldn't help it, you know. I tried I just, to keep I, I tried to keep that genie in the bottle, but <laughs> no, Zane, <laughs> you did it again. <laughs> we got Anthony Ivy losing by knockout to Lady Marmalade. <laughs> Zane, I just can't. <laughs> I just... Oh man. I just, <laughs> I just love that he's like a Christian Aguilera is like this hockey enforcer, you know, like what a what a huge change of concept. And like, I, I you know, I've been thinking this since he got signed to the UFC. It was just like, no, there's no no wonder this dude grew up having to be a fighter. You know, that's that's rough. That is a little rough. How old is he? I gotta see. He's, He's twenty eight. Like, yeah, 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 yeah. Just like coming, being in middle school and the core of her fame. You know. Yeah, that's gotta be tough. <laughs> no wonder. I wonder Still, what his fighting record is. He put it on Anthony Ivy out there. Mm, yeah, no mercy here. This was a uh, wow. This was a great way to kick off the night. I gotta say. I wasn't sure what to expect out of this one. But, yeah. Oh. I, I thought, the, you know, Aguilera usually wrestles a lot. Uh, Ivy tends to throw a few strikes and then lean on some wrestling to kind of cha- keep the, the tide of the fight in his favor. So I figured Aguilera would, his wrestling would be a little stronger. He'd take over and be able to grind out a win. But he just dropped some hammers on Ivy and that was it. Yeah, he he, he had the pace right away. Yep. He knew what he wanted to do. He wanted to let his hands go, and it's exactly what he did. And I think he he wobbled Ivy with a jab. It didn't. It was a really short punch. It didn't look yeah. like anything substantial or significant. But there was a little bit of a stanky leg there for Ivy. And then yeah. once Aguilera realized that, it was it was he, man. That was such a weird finishing uh, sequence. That it that was, that sort of slapping step elbow he hit him with yeah but... yeah it was, it, i don't think i've ever seen that in an mma fight before so that was cool and yep. the dude just bursted out in emotion and i love that these guys put so much into these camps especially when they're new on the scene and you know getting your first ufc i mean look at tyson nam got his first ufc win i mean he he was in tears yeah. trying to hold him back so it's it's cool to see someone's moment like all that hard work paying off yeah and it's you know Aguilar is a guy too who i think as you say he's in his late 20s now and he's been floating around for a little while too i don't know that he's been he's obviously not been at this nearly as long as nam but you know going back to 2013 seven years now and he's already had 19 fights 20 fights now yeah he's at 20 this is his 20th pro fight so Mm -hmm. you know that that it's always great to see somebody who's been working around the regional scene for a long time, putting in all the work, having their ups and downs and 
you know, guys like Aguilera and them, you look at their records on paper and you'd be like, you know, there were, there were times when the UFC roster wasn't so big where you'd be like, Oh man, these guys are never going to get to the UFC. Like yeah. they don't have, they don't have a record that'll ever get them picked up, but the UFC's signing more guys. Now they've got running way more shows anymore. They always need somebody. And so these guys get to step in on short notice. They get their moment and you know, they get to make something big out of it, which is great. Look at Brian Kelleher. He's yeah, he's living that dream right now. Absolutely, he's almost got. He, he's he's coming up on his tenth UFC bout already. That's awesome. Know? So yeah, that's that's really awesome. Dreams do yeah. come true, Zane. It's that, not all doom and gloom in the MMA world. That's right. Which pulls us back to our main event. <laughs> <laughs> Beautiful segue. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, <laughs> Cynthia Calvillo. Potentially putting us, throwing herself right into the title mix. Clearly a step ahead of Jessica I. All fight. Great, great performance for her in that way. Not a captivating performance. Not a fight card. People are going to be remembering next week, tomorrow, three days from now, whatever. No. But um, you know, for Calvia, who it seemed like she had kind of, you know, especially with her weight troubles. And that loss to Esparza, the draw against Rodriguez, kind of felt like she was stalling out at 125 or 115 pounds a little. Mm -hmm. And this is just suddenly like, you know, pushes her right into the top of another division. So not a fight without meaning, not a win without meaning for her. And uh, for I, this is going to, this is going to knock her back a ways because you know her, like I say, her, uh, her, her, rec- her right of contendership, her, her hold on that number one spot. It's not, it's not built on a terribly deep record. Well, no. So, in all reality, she will likely morph into the gatekeeper role, and yeah. the road to the title will have to go through her. Could very easily be. Uh, we're going to wrap things up there. You can find me on Twitter at the Zane Simon. You can find Eddie on Twitter at the Eddie Mercado. And we will be back next week with UFC on ESPN Blades versus Volkov. So tune in for that. Thanks, everyone.